Okay, well, let me say I'm glad you're all here. Thanks for coming. And this is the first service of Easter. Um, we, we cheat a little bit. It's not dark out. It should be dark out, but who wants it to be dark out, right? And so after we start, we go through the lighting of the candle, the Paschal candle, and then we actually take things in and set up the sanctuary again. Yes. So the things on the table have to. Okay. okay. So let's start with greeting and introduction. Grace and peace from Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. And also with you. Sisters and brothers in Christ on this most holy night, when our Savior Jesus Christ passed from death to life, we gather with all the church throughout the world in vigil and prayer. This is the Passover of Jesus Christ. Through light and the word, through water and the bread and wine, we recall Christ's death and resurrection we share Christ's triumph over sin and death, and with invincible hope, we await Christ's coming again. Hear the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the word was life, and the life was the light of all humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. To you be glory and praise forever. Your, your steadfast love extends to the heavens, and your faithfulness never ceases. Illumine our hearts with your wisdom, and strengthen our lives with your word. For you are the fountain of life. In your light we see true light. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever and ever. Christ rising in glory. Banish all darkness from our hearts and minds. Christ is our light. Thanks be to God. A reading from Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the water from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, 
to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. To you be glory and praise forever. And your faithfulness never ceases. Illuminate our hearts with your wisdom and strengthen our lives with your word. For you are the fountain of life, and in your light we see true light. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. <clears throat> Second reading, the fall, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that Yahweh God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. But the serpent <clears throat> For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed thick leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. But Yahweh God called the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be, uh, to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. And Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust shall eat you, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule. To the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, you are dust. Dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the only God made garments of skins for the man and his, for his wife and clothed them. And the only God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the only God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Let's sing together.
readings from Exodus chapter 14. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us up out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming the wall from them, on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the color of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall from them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The song of Miriam. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. <clears throat> the canticle. I will sing to the Lord, for the Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and has become my salvation. Who among the gods, O Yahweh, is like you? 
awesome and splendor, doing wonders. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, 
Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Thank you, Mary. Scriptures, 
right? So that's the stuff they have. And so there's several places in there that we get this idea. But one of the things that I, in recent years, kind of been turned on to, which I think is really good, is something we call the meta narrative. So we're saying, what's going on here in the life of the people and in the messages being brought? What's the overall message that we have here? And what's nice about this evening is we kind of go through that. So we start with the good creation. God created everything and saw that it was good and it was very good. And he places the first human couple in the midst of the garden so that they can enjoy the paradise. They can work it. But notice when they work it, it's productive. It's good. It's, there's no harshness. There's no hassle. There's no difficulty. Everything just kind of springs forth. Because in the curse, there is this remaining of the glory of creation, but the only way you're going to get it is by the sweat of your brow. And you have the wonder of life and childbirth, but how do you get it? Only through pain do you get this childbirth. But you still have the glory, but it's going to be some work, so it's difficult because things have been messed up. As I like to say, something mucked up the works, right? And that, that we just, it's just not running smoothly. I always think of an engine that is only firing on uh, two or four cylinders rather than the four or eight that it should be uh, firing on. And it's running, it's running smoothly, it hums along. But when you take something out, it's kind of like, you know, and that's kind of the way we are in the creation. That's the way it's working. And we say that the reason for that is the disobedience of the first human couple. And don't you love that story? Doesn't that resonate with every single person you've ever met? Why did you eat it? My wife told me to do it. Well, woman, why did you do it? The serpent told me to do it. You know that's true. You absolutely know that's true. That resonates with our human experience. So now they're banished from the garden. It's like, what are we going to do? And then now, in chapter 12 of Genesis, so that's chapter 3. Chapter 12, we start the rescue model. The rescue operation is the calling of Abraham. Out of you, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation. I'm going to create one out of you. I'm going to rest. This is the gospel. This is the glad tidings. I'm going to resurrect a new people. You want to think of it like that? It'll be appropriate. I'm going to resurrect this new people. Because out of the mess that's out there, it doesn't look good. In the flood story, you know, the, the, the reason God initiates the flood is because the inclination of all the hearts of humanity, of men, was evil and bad all the time. And then we hear these words. I think it's the saddest verse in the whole scripture. And God was sorry that he had made man upon the earth. Do you think that has really changed? Pick up the newspaper on any given day and read it. You go, I'm sure God is sorry he had made man upon but fortunately, God does not remain in his sorrow, but is in the work of rescue. So he starts with Abraham. I'm not going to make a great people. I'm going to raise this up. And through you, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And then we see exactly how the rescue operation is put into process when the people of Israel find themselves in slavery in Egypt and they cry out to the God of their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob about their oppression and their toil. And God raises up for them a deliverer, Moses. And Moses leads them out. And they get through the sea and then we hear the song of Miriam. The horse and the rider God has thrown into the sea. He has saved his people Israel. And that would be the motto. And then in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Moses, who was at the end of the journey for himself, who's led the people so far, not going to be able to cross over into the promised land, but he's going to see it. He could just see it in this act of grace because he's forbidden because of his impetuousness, actually. He goes up to the mountain and God shows him all this land, thus it shall be for my people, Israel. You have led them this far, all of them. And they are going to be as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand and the sheep seashore. And Moses says that a prophet greater than me will arise who will lead the people, who will deliver the people, who will save the people. So then as we hurl him to talk for actually a long time about all the ways in which God has delivered his people. But maybe the most vivid scene is in Ezekiel 30, 
the Sabbath, where Ezekiel's human ambition and laying before him is the dead bones, these dry bones, except. These dry bones are just laying there. And God says to Ezekiel, speak to the bones. Say, take on flesh and sunu and life. And, God, and Ezekiel spoke to the bones, and there was a clattering, and it's such a vivid picture. You know, we've got a wonderful advantage. I don't know why any of us have taken Canada for advantage. So all we've had for 3,000 years, or 2,500 years, or 2,000 years, whatever, the time period, various things, it are, are word pictures. And it really is amazing, these word pictures. But we can flash them on the screen. And can you imagine the dry bones lying in the valley? And you can hear them rattling, clanking, and then they come together. And then there's sinew on them. And then there's flesh. And then God says, breathe, tell them, speak to them. Speak to them and breathe into them the breath of life that they might become living beings. That's the picture of resurrection. That's what we have. And so they believe that the God of Israel, in spite of their sins, in spite of their uh, uh, going after other gods too frequently, in spite of their disobedience, God was going to stand behind them. And that at the end of time, there would be a resurrection of the dead. Now, I know this is very but I was watching on Netflix, there's a wonderful series, Schnitzel. It takes place, it's an it's a Orthodox Jewish community in Israel. I want you to know, I watched it in subtitles, this whole thing, right? And so the one guy says, and he just says it just routinely on the, okay, the person that passed. And we'll see that person in the resurrection of the dead. They're like, right? Yeah, that's their belief, right? So th they said that they will see, this is a Jewish belief, that they will see in the resurrection of the dead. So when we say we believe in the resurrection of the dead, we join with those who have for thousands of years said that at the end of the age, there is going to be a resurrection of the dead. When God comes forth, when he brings forth the victory, and the resurrection of the dead will be God's vindication for the faithful, for those who have not bent the knee to worship the other gods, for those who have observed Torah, who have followed in that way. And what they saw on this day was that which they had known about, which the prophecy told them about, what Ezekiel gave to them as a picture, when Moses spoke about the prophet who would arise, had come to pass. So when they heard that Jesus had been raised from the dead, it was not, oh, now for the first time we believe in life after death. Because there's all kinds of people who believe in life after death. And it was a kind of life, by the way, I have no interest in, just to let you know. All the other visions about what it's going to be like doesn't appeal to me. But this one appeals to me because what we see in Jesus Christ, Paul says, is the prototype of what the resurrection of the dead is to be. So what they saw when they heard the message that Jesus was not there, that he had risen from the dead, was the resurrection of the dead is real. It's possible. It's happened. And it's happened to this one. Now that's a little twist on it. They weren't expe exactly expecting it to happen to this one. But if you think about it, think about what the resurrection is. This is the one to whom the resurrection of the dead would come. The perfect one. The one who was without sin. The one who went to the cross and suffered and died for us now has been vindicated by God. Isn't that what Paul says in Philippians 2? Talking about Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Hung on. But made himself nothing being made in human likeness, taking on the form of a slave. He became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. This perfect one. God cannot abandon him to the grave. He's righteous and good. He has borne our sins. By his stripes we are healed. But if he's in the grave, we're not healed. If he's in the grave, it's no victory. Then Paul goes on. Therefore, God has given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Why? Because he has risen from the dead. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father as the victorious Lamb. One of the great, wonderful images. It comes to us in Revelation, but you can actually see it depicted is a picture of a lamb that looks like it is slain, 
but is reigning on the throne. It looks like it was slain. It's reigning on the throne. Why? Because God raised him. message utterly transformed the world in which it was brought. That's why they call it the glad tidings. Jesus is Lord. Why? God raised him from the dead. Jesus is the king forever. Why? God raised him from the dead. Jesus offers to us new life and freedom and the opportunity to be rescued from this world. Why? God raised him from the dead. And because he is risen, he is Lord of all, and as Paul says later in 1 Corinthians 15, because of that, he has finally put all the enemies under his foot. The final enemy is death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, because he has risen from the dead. Let us pray. O oh, great and glorious King, we honor your name forever. And with the throngs, we gather at the throne, and we sing, he is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead, he is Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. May this be our song on our lips and our lives forever. O great and sovereign God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, thine is the glory.
would then be brought forward and this would be a time of baptism into the faith. And for those of us who have been baptized, it's a time to remember our baptism with the renewal of the baptismal vows. So if you'll join with me. In baptism, God calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. To follow Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. Therefore I ask, do you reject the devil and all rebellion against God? I reject them. Do you renounce the deceit and corruption of evil? I renounce them. Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbor? I repent of them. Do you turn to Christ as Savior? I turn to Christ. Do you submit to Christ as Lord? I submit to Christ. Do you come to Christ, the way, the truth, and the life? I come to Christ. Christ claims you for his own. Receive the sign of the cross. Do not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Find validly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world, and the devil, and remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. May Almighty God deliver you from the powers of darkness, restore you to the image of his glory, and lead you in the light and obedience of Christ. Amen. Will you please stand for the Apostles' Creed? Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, Mary Seated. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. In the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea, into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We thank you, O God, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death, and from it, we are raised to share in the resurrection. The, uh, through it, we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we celebrate our fellowship in him in faith. We pray that all who have passed through the water of baptism may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit. The all honor and glory now and forever. Jesus Christ our Lord, 
You lived among us, manifesting your glory. Christ died that we might live and is risen to raise us to new life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your most holy name. And 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The body of Christ broken for you, take in remembrance that Christ died for you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.